There are few conflicts as controversial as that between Israel and the Gaza Strip. Many consider this 25 mile long region on Israel's southern border to be occupied territory. But what is less known is that there has actually been no Israeli presence in Gaza since 2005. Back then, Israel made a risky and extraordinarily divisive move by unilaterally removing all of its military forces and uprooting all of its civilian settlements from Gaza, leaving the Palestinians to govern themselves. Viewing the Palestinian leadership as unwilling to work together with Israel to advance peace talks, the withdrawal was meant to, in the meantime, both reduce the conflict between Gaza and Israel and help improve Israeli security. Hopefully, this would lead the Palestinian leadership to get back on track and resume peace negotiations with Israel. This ambitious gamble was conducted by none other than Ariel Sharon, one of Israel's most right-wing prime ministers known for his combative military background and hardline pro-settlement stance. This was the military leader who titled his 1989 autobiography, Warrior, and it was a gamble, one that many consider to be a failure. How did this unilateral move create intense division and tension within Israel, and what were its consequences? To answer this question, let's take a few steps back. Well, maybe more than a few. When we say the Gaza Strip, what exactly are we talking about? Gaza has been inhabited since at least 3000 BCE and has been ruled by dozens of empires. But by the early 16th century, Gaza and the rest of the region called Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire, which stretched across the Middle East. Things stayed that way until the end of World War I when the region fell to the British. The British continued to administer the land under what they called the Palestine Mandate, or the British Mandate for Palestine, with an aim of determining a future for the Jews and the Arabs living there. They tried to keep a lid on the region, but didn't really go well. There were infighting, riots, revolts on both Jewish and Arab sides. By 1947, Britain was fed up and decided to relinquish their control of the region. The UN voted in favor of the historic partition plan, dividing the region into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jewish leadership agreed to the plan, while the Arab leadership declared war. The Jews declared the establishment of the State of Israel on the section of the Palestine Mandate that had been assigned to them. After being attacked by the surrounding Arab armies, Israel pushed back, extending its boundaries to more defensible and viable positions and emerged from its War of Independence victorious. As for the rest of the Palestine Mandate, during the war, the West Bank with its Palestinian inhabitants was taken by the Jordanians, and Gaza with its Palestinian inhabitants by the Egyptians and any Jewish communities that had existed in those regions were dismantled. Jump forward to 1967. Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser was threatening the annihilation of Israel and backed it up by moving his tanks and troops into the Sinai Peninsula. With war imminent, Israel launched a preemptive strike that was so successful it crippled the Arab state's air forces and Israel won the war in just six days. In its victory, Israel secured Gaza, Sinai, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank giving the state more defensible borders and reducing future threats. But by gaining control of these territories, Israel also came to govern a large Arab population who were neither Israeli citizens nor eager to be under Israeli rule. Meanwhile, a grassroots movement began in which Israeli citizens began to return to the newly secured land. Some of these areas, mainly in the West Bank, had been home to Jewish communities in the years leading up to the War of Independence, while others had not been settled by Jews in centuries. Some of the settlers, as they came to be called, were motivated by religious reasons, aiming to restore historical and biblical claims to the land, which had been under ancient Jewish rule for approximately a thousand years. This sentiment applied mainly in the West Bank, the region surrounding Jerusalem, which had always been central to the Jewish nation and faith. Other settlers, mainly in Sinai, were motivated by a more modern, secular, pioneering perspective, and still others were motivated by security concerns wanting to establish a populated buffer between Israel and its surrounding Arab enemy states. Eventually, in 1979, Egypt made peace with Israel in exchange for Israel returning the Sinai to the Egyptians. Israel made the difficult sacrifice of uprooting its settlements in Sinai in a tense and emotionally charged atmosphere that was only a taste of what would come two decades later during Israel's evacuation of Gaza. After a six-year-long violent popular uprising known as the First Intifada that began in 1987, Israel attempted to broker a comprehensive peace with the Palestinians. In 1993, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat signed a series of agreements on the White House lawn known as the Oslo Accords, which would serve as a guide for future negotiations. The future negotiations would work to effectively transfer civilian responsibility of Gaza and the West Bank to the newly formed Palestinian Authority. That meant police and security, local government, maintenance of infrastructure, and more, all being run autonomously by the Palestinians. For a short time, peace looked like it might actually be possible, but negotiations began to break down as a wave of suicide attacks by Hamas and the group Islamic Jihad swept across Israel in the mid and late 90s. 
Other factors included the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin and some say the continuation of building in the West Bank. In a last-ditch effort for peace, U.S. President Bill Clinton hosted Prime Minister Ehud Barak and Palestinian Authority Chairman Yasser Arafat at the 2000 Camp David Summit, during which Arafat was presented with an unprecedented offer. But Arafat walked away, stunning Clinton who years later said, I killed myself to give the Palestinians a state. I had a deal they turned down that would have given them all of Gaza, between 96 and 97 percent of the West Bank, and compensating land in Israel. With the breakdown of Camp David, the violence of the Second Intifada erupted in September of 2000, now conducted by both Hamas and Arafat's PLO. Many Israelis became disillusioned about the prospects for peace, and the country elected a right-wing government headed by former military officer Ariel Sharon. In the midst of a Palestinian uprising, with this hardline politician who had a controversial military history as prime minister, you'd expect some unyielding and uncompromising policies, right? Well, that's not exactly what happened. Sharon began, predictably, by cracking down on Palestinian terrorism. But then, in December of 2003, he made an astounding move, the unilateral decision to withdraw 100% of Israeli military forces and civilians from Gaza. Withdrawal from territory was something he had campaigned against, and that was withdrawal from pretty much any territory, let alone withdrawal from 100% of Gaza. It's like imagine a Republican president suddenly deciding to pass universal health care or sweeping gun control legislation. Sharon formed a coalition with the left-wing opposition in order to pass the plan, calling for the complete withdrawal by the summer of 2005. Now, these weren't some small tent cities where Israelis were slumming it. Gush Katif in the south of Gaza was a block of 17 towns populated by 8,800 Jews in fully built communities with roads, infrastructure, industry, even state-of-the-art greenhouses, much of which had been there for decades. But the facts on the ground were that the Israeli settlers in Gaza were outnumbered by Palestinians more than 170 to 1, and in the five years prior, 124 Israelis had been killed by Palestinians in the region. Many believed the cost of maintaining a force of thousands of soldiers in Gaza to protect a relatively small Jewish population no longer made sense. Some also saw these settlements as an obstacle to peace. Others argued that these settlements acted as a buffer to Palestinian aggression, warning that without them, Gaza could turn into a breeding pool for terror and a launching pad for attacks against all of Israel. In the months leading up to the withdrawal, the country was virtually split in two. Sharon's supporters, needless to say, felt betrayed. Those opposing the withdrawal tied orange ribbons to their car, while those in favor flew blue ones. Objections from the orange side cried, a Jew does not expel a Jew, pleading on the case of the settlers who had no idea where they would go. They insisted it was a travesty that the Palestinians be rewarded for the violence of the Second Intifada and the terrorism that followed it. Massive demonstrations were held. In one protest called the Human Chain, tens of thousands of Israelis held hands for almost 60 miles connecting Gaza to the Western Wall in Jerusalem. But despite such vocal and visible outcry, public opinion polls showed that an almost two-thirds majority were actually placed on the blue side of the debate and supported the disengagement plan in hopes that it would bring peace. Opinions were passionate on both sides, and there was a palpable tension between the two camps. Removing almost 9,000 civilians from their homes was as arduous as it was heartbreaking. There had been apprehension that IDF soldiers might even disobey their orders to carry out the evacuation. But in the end, they followed the commands, some even crying as they removed people from their homes. Many Gush Katif residents felt betrayed by their country. They were promised the construction of new homes, and some were even paid up front for relocation. But with the painfully slow machine that is bureaucracy, many of them found themselves living as refugees in caravan-filled trailer parks, unable to find employment or to move on with their lives. Many desperate residents burned through the government compensation payments just to get by. A third of them even remained in this limbo situation for over a decade, finally signing deals for permanent housing in 2016. So was the plan a success? Well, perhaps, if your name is Hamas. The Islamist terrorist group was elected to power four months after the pullout, defeating Fatah, the political branch of the PLO, in an unexpected turnaround. This ended years of Fatah domination in Palestinian politics. Fatah wasn't willing to hand over control so easily, which led to a brief civil war in Gaza. During this war, Hamas took over Gaza and executed Fatah supporters, further consolidating their power. Once in control, instead of building up their economy and infrastructure and providing for Palestinians' daily needs, the Hamas leadership used its resources to wage war on Israel. Hundreds of millions of dollars in humanitarian aid and supplies were used to launch thousands of rocket attacks at civilian population centers throughout Israel. 
Materials were repurposed to construct miles of underground tunnels in order to infiltrate Israel and conduct terror attacks, abductions, and smuggle weapons. A generation of children in southern Israel were raised to know that when they hear a siren, they had 15 to 30 seconds to find shelter. The continuous terrorism and rocket attacks provoked Israeli military retaliation time and again. Israelis and Palestinians were forced to endure three consecutive wars in Gaza between 2008 and 2014. The aggression also led Israel to enforce strict borders, both on land and sea, to prevent further terrorist activity and Israeli civilian casualties. A few years later, Egypt also enforced strict borders with Gaza on their end as well. The result of this is that Gaza now has both the world's worst performing economy and highest unemployment rate. Hamas's misappropriation of financial aid towards the building of weapons and tunnels doesn't exactly help the economic situation either. With all these factors at play, peace between Israel and Gaza seems to be less and less of a possibility as rockets and other terrorist activities continue to be launched against Israel. To many, Ariel Sharon's plan for withdrawal seems to have been a failure. Before the pullout, two-thirds of the country was in favor of the move. But now, a recent poll sponsored by the Big and Sadat Center for Strategic Studies found that half of Israelis believe the withdrawal was a mistake and are even in favor of returning to the coastal cities of Gaza. But as former National Security Advisor Yaakov Amidrur puts it, I thought it was a stupid act at the time, and I think so today. But that doesn't mean we can go back to Gaza. We cannot unscramble the eggs. The plan to disengage from Gaza brought about great tension and division within Israeli society between politicians and opposition parties, between blue ribboners supporting the withdrawal and orange ribboners opposing it, between Israeli soldiers and settlers. But what is important to recognize is that when push came to shove, Israelis respected the rule of law, and the violence that many predicted would occur within Israeli society didn't materialize. Still, it remains a source of great pain to a large portion of Israeli society, and one that influences many Israelis' willingness to concede more territory without a guarantee of peace. Thanks for watching. See you guys next week. Oh,